here's a segment from a recent Gun Talk Radio episode. You can listen to all the Gun Talk Radio podcasts however you tune in, or check out guntalk.com for more. Last week, I missed an important milestone. It was our anniversary here on Gun Talk. As of last week, we have been on the air 27 years. We're now in our 28th year of Gun Talk Radio. Um, you probably, if you've been around a while, you've heard me tell the story. It came about as a result of a conversation with Alan Gottlieb of the Second Amendment Foundation at the SHOT Show 27 years ago. I, at the time, was doing magazine writing for Sports of Field and Guns and Ammo and some other magazines. I was on ESPN as a co-host of the Shooting Sports America TV show, co-hosting it with my father, Gritz Gresham. And Alan said, you know, have you ever done radio? I said, no, I've never been on radio. radio. Never thought about it. Six weeks later, I'm doing a national radio show. Weirdest turn of events ever. I never thought about doing it. And, and I will tell you, honestly, I thought, ah, let's give it six to 12, maybe 13 weeks. We'll see how it goes. I can always bail. And it must have worked out. 27 years later, we're here. It's interesting to look at what was going on then. The year was 1995. What was going on with guns, and particularly with gun control and gun politics in the United States? And frankly, why the stage was set for there to be a gun talk radio. Okay, 1995, Rush Limbaugh had been syndicating his show for only three years. The mainstream media had a lock, an absolute lock on the flow of information, or misinformation, if you prefer. Um, there was no social media to speak of. The Internet was fairly new. Uh, there was no way to get a message out. There was no, there really were no conservative outlets at the time. We knew we were being lied to. We knew that the media was repeating what the Democratic publicists were telling them to say, especially when it came to guns and gun rights and gun crime and self-defense use of guns. We knew this because we had magazines, Guns and Ammo, I was writing for that. I was writing about politics and gun politics and Guns and Ammo way back then. But the idea of talk radio was pretty new. And then the idea of doing a talk radio show about guns really lit a fire under a lot of people, a lot of people in the industry, a lot of people out there. And, and my goal, and I guess I should explain this, you say, why, why did you do it in the first place? I wanted to be a source of what I called intellectual ammunition, where I could share information. I covered this stuff for you. I've been writing about guns and gun rights since 1969. Yeah, 69. I've <sighs> been following this a long time. And I wanted to share a lot of what I had learned and share some of the techniques that I use in combating the lies that are out there. None of that's changed, of course. We use the same old lies today. Same people. Joe Biden was instrumental in the passage of the Bill Clinton gun ban, 1994. In Bill Clinton's State of the Union address in 1995, January of 1995, right after the passage of the Clinton gun ban, also known as the assault weapons ban, which of course it wasn't. He said this, he says, last, the last Congress also passed the Brady Bill and in the crime bill, the ban on 19 assault weapons. This is Bill Clinton speaking. This was after the, remember, the 1994 midterm elections when Democrats were crushed, primarily because of passage of the Brady Bill and the crime bill. Clinton continued, I don't think it's a secret to anybody in this room that several members of the last Congress who voted for that, talk about the assault weapons ban, aren't here tonight, aren't here tonight because they voted for it. In other words, they got defeated at the polls because they voted for gun bans. He says, and I know therefore that some of you who are here because they voted for it are under enormous pressure to repeal it. 
I just have to tell you how I feel about it. So Bill Clinton continues, love this part. The members of Congress who voted for that bill and I would never do anything to infringe upon the right to keep and bear arms, to hunt, and to engage in other appropriate sporting activities. 1995 State of the Union Address, he's saying, we lost the midterm elections because we voted for gun control, but I still want you to keep voting for gun control. <laughs> and we support the Second Amendment as long as it's for sporting use. Fast forward to the State of the Union Address two weeks ago. Joe Biden, using the same meme, nobody needs a gun that holds 100 rounds. What do you think, deer are wearing Kevlar vests? It never was. It is not now. It will never be about hunting. The Second Amendment is about protecting ourselves and our country. All you have to do is turn on the TV right now, see what's going on in Ukraine. They're handing out any guns they can get to citizens there to protect themselves and their country. Of course, the State of the Union address this time. This is part of that whole intellectual ammunition deal, right? Biden was actually slapped with an AP, Associated Press, fact check, where he lies again. He says he called for the repeal of the liability shield that makes gun manufacturers the only industry in America that can't be sued. AP says that's false. It says while gun makers do have legal protections from being held liable for injuries caused by criminal misuse of their weapons, they are not exempt or immune from being sued. Another lie that Biden just keeps on telling. 1995, to put this in perspective, when Gun Talk Radio started, we were in the midst, kind of the beginning to midst, of the march of concealed carry laws being passed by legislatures across the country, one by one by one. At each time, it was debated in the legislature. And sometimes it took years and years and years of going back and going back and going back. In Texas, they passed it, they passed it, they passed it. Governor Ann Richards vetoed it. So finally, they just replaced the governor. Said, we'll just get another governor. At each time, in every single state, we got the same things. Blood will run in the streets. Every fender bender accident will become a shootout. And then when they passed concealed carry, a year or two later, when nothing had happened, and the people who had concealed carry permits were not indiscriminately shooting people, there may have been a story on page B-17 of the newspaper where they're quoting a local sheriff saying, well, you know, I'm really surprised. Really haven't seen any bad effects from this. Even after dozens of states had passed it, they kept saying, well, blood will run the streets, you know. 1995. Well, let's go to 2022, right now. Constitutional carry, state after state passing it. Blood will run in the streets. <laughs> Every fender bender will be a shootout. Really? We're doing this three decades later? Same deal, same argument, same nonsense, and still being repeated by the media? Yes. And that's why I came up with the term intellectual ammunition. I share what I know. I share the techniques I've used. I share the phrases I've used. You have heard so many phrases from different people not knowing that they came from me. I mean, the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Yeah, that's me. Here, yeah, Wayne LaPierre picked that one up. That's okay. We're sharing the information, right? The analogies of use of uh, fire extinguisher. You have a fire extinguisher in your home. Why? to control the situation until reinforcements get there, until the fire department can get there. It's exactly the same thing with your personal defense firearm. It's not to save the world, it's to control the situation until reinforcements can arrive. I put it out there, you pick it up and you use it. One of the reasons I started Gun Talk Radio 27 years ago, we just passed our 27 year anniversary. We're in the 28th year now, crazy. Also been doing the show with uh, Jim Kenzie and crew for right at almost 20 years. We actually started doing podcasts even before that. Well, actually, it probably is not correct to call it podcasts because we started putting gun talk on the air, on, on line, actually, 
before there was a podcast, before there were iPods, so there couldn't be a podcast. Got a, an email from Dave Reiner right after started the show. He says, you really ought to be putting this uh, on the Internet. And it's like, yeah, the Internet's just like barely there at the time. And I said, well, I don't know how to do that. What are you talking about? He said, well, I know how to do that. I'll do it for you. Dave Reiner. You'll love this technology. We would take a CD recording of the show each week and mail it, like U.S. mail, mail it to Dave in California, and he would rip the CD, and then he would upload it and put it on the Internet for us using real audio, not MP3. There's a proprietary way of, of putting audio out, audio files, real audio. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. He's no longer with us, but we sure do appreciate that. So we were podcasting before there was a podcast, before there were iPods. Crazy stuff. Uh, Gun Talk Radio, this show, was actually created to be an end run around the media. It kind of like all talk radio was at the time. There were very few talk radio shows, really. Certainly not very few uh, syndicated shows. The idea was they can't shut us down. They don't control us. I was on a network for a while. It's weird. The network actually cratered. It collapsed and went away. We were off the air for two weeks while we were figuring out what to do. And it, there's, at that point, I decided, you know, I'll just syndicate this thing myself. So from that time forward, I buy satellite time directly. I syndicate the show. Gun Talk is self-syndicated. We, we're not on a network. We're in control. Well, we're in control until something else happens. You never know. But uh, so far, so good, as we like to say. Uh, 1995, you have these unintended consequences. You had the, the Clinton gun ban of 1994, banning a number of different kinds of semi-automatic rifles and standard capacity magazines. Same as today, what they're trying to do right now. What was interesting, though, is that at the time, not many people really knew much about an AR-15 rifle. People were using bolt-action rifles for hunting, and they thought these military-looking things were ugly. Who needs one? But then they, we, me, all looked at it and said, whoa, you're going to ban it? Then I want one. Actually, I went out and bought two in 1994. Didn't know a darn thing about them. But I learned. I got uh, Olympic arms. And I got a Colt H-Bar Sporter. Still have them, <laughs> along with a few others. Uh, you know, that unattended consequence thing, we're going to ban semi-automatic firearms, and then all of a sudden, by doing that, you make them popular. And the only way, and people say, well, why don't we have that ban now? Because two things, hubris and practicality. The hubris on the part of the Democrat Party, they had been in control of Congress for 40 years. They had had the majority in Congress, both houses, for 40 years before they passed the 1994 gun ban. They couldn't quite get it passed at the time, so they said, well, here's what we'll do. We'll offer the Republicans this. Uh, it will automatically sunset in 10 years unless it's renewed. Of course, they're thinking... We've been in control for 40 years. In 10 years, we'll just renew it. Again, the irony, the unintended consequences of the whole thing. The very act of passing the Clinton gun ban in 1994 cost the Democrats control of Congress after 40 years. Their hubris in thinking that they couldn't lose and them making this promise that, well, it will sunset in 10 years, wink, wink, nod, nod, we know that'll never happen, actually killed the bill. After 10 years, the Clinton gun ban sunset it. It expired. It went away as though there was never anything there. Oh, one point to remember. The 1994 Clinton gun ban, it was supported by former presidents Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan. Again, part of what we do here is just help people get the word out and remind you. I mean, it's what I do. It's, it's what I do all day, every day. I can't get it all out on the radio, though. I can't 
give you all the information. And so that's why I share a lot of it through Twitter. It's just a, a chosen way to get information out, primarily through links that I share there to stories that are out there. All that to say that if you follow me on Twitter, I'm at Gun Talk. That's how they do things on Twitter, at Gun Talk. You will, throughout the day, throughout the week, see links to stories. You'll, you can click on them and go, oh, okay, that's what's going on. Oh, here's some news. And you can stay informed. You, in fact, will probably be, probably be the most informed person in your community, in your core group, when it comes to gun rights because you're seeing what's going on almost real time. Because as I see it, I share it. That's, that's what we do. I put as much out as I can on the air. We are time limited here. And of course we cover a lot of different things and not just politics. We cover what's going on with guns. I mean, and wow, what a difference in guns in the last 27 years. Not so much like the bolt action rifles, although in that area, they've become much, much, much more accurate. The weird part is we have very expensive, accurate rifles, and we have very inexpensive, accurate rifles. Thank you, Savage, for starting that. That was amazing what you did there, and all the manufacturers have followed along. You could buy a $600 rifle today that's more accurate than a target rifle was 30 years ago. It's kind of crazy. And in the world of handguns, you link conceal carry movement with what happened in handguns. It went from full-size you know, revolvers and semi-autos to compacts to subcompacts and now we have the micro like the micro nines that are out there it's a whole different genre of handguns you have a lot of people buying guns now that never would have before who've looked at it and, and frankly they're able to see through what the media is telling them because of talk radio like gun talk because of other outlets today alternative outlets and they look at it and say, you know, these people who are telling us, look, just call the police. It'll be fine. They'll show up maybe sometime. And people are looking at the riots because we get to see it in video. They're looking at the crime and they're saying, you know, we're going to take care of ourselves. Enough of this. They're there. We'll take care of you. You don't have to do that. So we have something on the order of 20 million people who have carry permits and probably 60 to 100 million people now who live in states where they don't have to have a permit to carry a gun for their own protection. And that's continuing. Alabama governor just signed permitless carry into law, and a permitless carry bill is on the desk of Governor DeWine in Ohio. He either will or won't sign it, probably won't veto it. it if he signs it, it becomes law. If he doesn't sign it and doesn't veto it, it becomes law. That's Ohio. More updates as we go along, and we'll talk about church security teams and one state's effort to eliminate them by somehow linking them with militias.